Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Levitt. I'm Tommy Vitor. The Republican National Convention lineup has been announced, and it's a real who's who of Trump staff and family members. On Monday, <laughs> we got Donald Trump Jr., Donald Trump Jr.'s girlfriend, Kim Guilfoyle, and Donald Trump. Tuesday night, we got Melania Trump, Eric Trump, Tiffany Trump, and Donald Trump again. Wednesday night, we got Lara Trump and Donald Trump again. Thursday night, Ivanka Trump, and one more time, Donald Trump. The Republican Party also announced that they will not be releasing any policy platform other than to reassert, quote, the party's strong support for President Donald Trump and his administration. <laughs> Meanwhile, Trump has released a second term agenda that includes bullets like, quote, teach American exceptionalism, drain the globalist swamp, and return to normal in 2021. Love it. I'm, I'm not really getting a uh, not me us vibe from this convention. What about you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, he already started this morning. You know, the 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 he went to the podium already today for his uplifting convention and spent the whole time railing against uh, the scourge of people voting. So uh, it's already off to a great spot. They already done. They already also did their um. Uh, their roll call, and we had people all across the country in these magnificent vistas showing the best of America, and it was just <laughs> white fat head after white fat head just being like, we hate Joe Biden, and we're sending Kentucky's votes to Donald Trump. So they're they're already um they're already kind of failing to meet the uh, expectations set over the weekend. Um, and I, love it. I can't believe you would be this hard on a, on a good step and repeat. <laughs> look, it, look, it looks gorgeous. <laughs> looks, yeah, there looks like they're on their way into a Dinesh D'Souza documentary. But the um, <laughs> the other, the other, this is stupid and this is small. American exceptionalism is not something you claim to teach. It's an insult at people who believe America is exceptional. It was coined by Joseph Stalin. If you say, if you say, I think the Yankees are the best team, you don't say I'm a Yankees exceptionalist. You think the Yankees are the best. Other people think you're stupid and don't notice what's wrong with the Yankees. If you love America and think America is the best, it's not because you believe in America and exceptionalism. It's because you're, that's your evaluation of countries. See what I'm saying? Do you I'm, see why I mean, it's stupid? Look, I'm glad that bothered you. I, I do think <laughs> the fact that they have decided to forego a policy platform this year <laughs> no I, I, this is a small for whatever note. for whatever dear leader note. wants <laughs> that's also one of two things in the that's their education platform which is absolutely incredible also one thing i noticed in the platform i don't is um uh repealing obamacare not uh high on his on his agenda anymore that's gone that's out of there so i wonder i wonder i wonder how they're explaining that to themselves tommy what are the uh what are the potential downsides of having this much Trump? <laughs> <laughs> you guys notice they've been calling him the talent in chief. That's a, that's a cute little oh. uh, thing in their background. So like, it's not totally clear what his role is every night. Jason Miller is out today saying he might just be appearing and not speaking every night, but I don't believe him. I think it's very hard to drag Trump in front of a microphone and not have him speak. So like on a basic level, um, his approval rating is... 41, 42 percent, right? which means your message every night is going to be carried by someone who's deeply unpopular. Yes, there are other speakers, but he's going to lead the news coverage. He's going to lead everything that spins out of this event every night. So I don't know that that's ideal. Normally, conventions are structured to let validators carry the message for you and tell your story because they can often make the case better than you can. And so, you know, look at Michelle Obama's speech, right? She comes into that. She's a 60% approval rating. She's a 91% approval rating among Democrats. She makes a case for Biden's character. She presents this devastating critique of Trump that makes news in all these different ways and appeals to different audiences. And I, like, I, I think that's more beneficial. I just wonder if this is going to be too much Trump, right? I mean, it's not the same as the as the daily coronavirus briefing because he's giving a speech. It's not a Q&A, but that did hurt him politically. I also just wonder if it's going to get boring. I mean, right, he spoke for 45 minutes already this morning. I mean, it feels like too much. Uh, so potential upsides, right? I mean, he has commanded the political debate over the last four years, unlike any president we've ever seen. Um, despite the fact that the RNC says this will be hopeful, my guess is that Trump is just going to uh, end the night every night with another broadside against Joe Biden, and that can add up. Uh, another upside for them, I guess, if we're being honest, is it's not like they've got a ton of great options, right? I mean, most of the keynote speakers are named Trump. They're just shittier versions of him. It's not like Matt Geitz or Jim Jordan 
who have no name ID are, are going to carry the message well, like drunk ass Rudy Giuliani, an assortment of White House staffers. Like it, it's slim picking. So none of this is to say it won't be a successful RNC. Um, it might be. I just imagine it's just going to be a sustained negative assault on Joe Biden. I mean, I, I saw one. I, uh, I saw one run of show that said Jim Traffickant parens if alive. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I do very much enjoy watching the best laid plans of the fucking goobers who work for Donald Trump instantly meet reality on the first morning of the convention. Like their job right now is to turn this election into a choice between Joe Biden and Donald Trump and to move it away from a referendum on Donald Trump and his leadership. That's what they're trying to do. So that's why you got Miller out there and Kelly and Conway and all the rest of them talking about this hopeful, optimistic convention versus the Democrats' dark, scary convention, right? Which is like bullshit already. <laughs> and then they were talking about like, it won't be, R Ronna McDaniel, the Republican National Committee chairwoman actually said, it's not gonna be Trump-centric like the Democratic <laughs> convention is. It's gonna be about real people who've benefited. It's like, they know that their strategic imperative is to do that, is to turn it into a choice between Trump and Biden and to try to defend Donald Trump's record and talk about the second term. Like they know this is what they need to do. And then about an hour into the convention on Monday morning, Donald Trump storms in, gives a speech longer than Joe Biden's acceptance speech, where he just rambles on, accuses Democrats of stealing the election, talks about Spygate, talks about Barack Obama, goes off on this thing. And it's just like, it's always about him. And he makes it about him all the time. <laughs> yeah, I would I would say too, I think I would, I would say in what Trump said today, so there's whatever they'll claim about the message, you know, Kellyanne Conway will take a break from trust falls with Claudia and George to like, let us know what the message is gonna be. <laughs> Can I say that? It's fine. And uh, and like Ronna Romney McDaniel will say whatever she wants to say. Um, but like Trump today, this morning, I think actually says what the message will be because you can't put bounds on what he'll do. He'll say what it is. And really what he said today is, if it wasn't for me, the virus would have killed millions. Uh, if it wasn't for me, everything would have been worse. I shut down travel from Europe. I shut down travel from China. Everyone told me that that was stupid. None of this is true. Um, and if you give Joe Biden the reins, America won't come back. He's going to shut it down. Things will be worse than ever before. And so in a way, I think what he's trying to basically do is he's trying to declare bankruptcy. He's trying to say, all right, let's go back to zero. Let's cancel all the old debts. None of that was my fault. I'm not paying for any of it. We're back at zero because that's what he knows how to do. Uh, and his hope is that he can spend a week basically terrifying people about Joe Biden, claiming that America won't come back if Joe Biden is president. Yeah, I mean, their optimistic message is an is a apocalyptic message. I mean, normally an, an optimistic message means painting a, a better future for you and me. Here's my plan for that vision. Or here's my plan for that future. Like, here's my vision. There was some hand wringing at the DNC because Biden didn't spend enough time, some people think, uh, talking about his economic plans. Maybe that's right. Maybe I don't know. But Trump's second term agenda so far is 50 bullet points. I mean, it just if that's all they've got there, they have to fill in the rest with just attacks on Biden. Well, also, does anyone think that if asked, Trump would be able to repeat any of those bullet points? I mean, he was on Fox no. News Sunday night and the host asked him about his second term agenda and what he would do. And he said, quote, I would strengthen what we've done and I would do new things. He, he's whiffed <laughs> on that question on Fox four times. Literally four times. That's Fox. That's Fox. Like, it's what amazing. else is it? Yeah. Um, all right, let's talk about how last week's Democratic National Convention has been received by the public so far. In a few new polls conducted over the weekend, Joe Biden maintained or just slightly increased his lead over Donald Trump, which is now an average of nine points. <clears throat> but a number of polls have also shown that the favorability ratings for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have risen by a decent margin, especially among independents, black voters, and Democrats more of whom now say they're very enthusiastic about voting for Biden. Um, Tommy, what do you think this says about the success of the Democratic Convention and how much the convention matters to the overall race? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's this silly discussion about whether or not people get a convention bump that is actually kind of dated. I think the average convention bump since 2004 is about two points. So I think if you look inside those polls, there actually was good news. I think the one you mentioned, you know, there's two that I saw, John. Axios and SurveyMonkey, they showed a 14-point improvement in Biden's net favorable rating with independents. Uh, and Biden and Kamala Harris got a five-point bump in their favorability with Democrats. And then CBS did a poll where they said to voters, um, they asked voters why you were voting for Joe Biden. And the percentage of people who said, because I like Joe Biden, went from 29% pre-convention to 38% post-convention. So that makes it seem like they did do an effective job of explaining to people who Joe Biden is, his values, his character, uh, the things he would do for them as president, which I would view as a success. Love it. What do you think? Yeah, that was the number that I, I th sort of stood out to me. It was what we talked about, actually. Dan, I think, actually, on the pod, set a marker down saying he wanted to see a change in the number of people who were supporting Biden to support Biden versus supporting Biden to oppose Trump. And that 9% shift, I think, is really important. Um, you know, one thing that has just become clear is that as conventions, as we, you know, uh, uh, with each passing convention, the number of persuadable people watching goes down. That's just the nature of polarization and that there's fewer persuadable people watching the convention. And one of the hardest jobs is to reach the kind of people you could persuade, but might not be paying attention. Yeah. And I, I think that has been the trend, as you both point out, generally over time. I also think that this election in particular so far has been incredibly stable. Um, despite all that's happened, right? Like the margin between Trump and Biden has not, um, has been fairly stable. And I think more people have already made up their minds in this election, certainly than in 2016. I think that the morning consult poll um, showed that, you know, Biden didn't get a huge bounce so far and neither did, and Hillary got a few points after 2016. But after 2016, I think Morning Consult found the race like 44-40 Hillary over Trump, right? Which means there's a lot of undecided voters. Now it's like 51, 52, 43, which means that Biden's over 50, meaning that a lot more people have made up their minds and a lot of other polls have shown that. So I think what that means for both the Democratic convention and what we're about to see this week is that we may not see a big bump for either Biden or Donald Trump. But I think what the Biden campaign has wanted is a lot of Biden's lead comes from sort of voters who are softer in their support. So they're voting for Joe Biden because they really just don't like Donald Trump. If those people, after a week of the Democratic convention, decide that they like Joe Biden a lot more, they're going to be firmer in their support for Joe Biden. And that's going to harden that margin that we've already seen build over the last couple of months. Hopefully, um, we'll see what the Republican National Convention does to that lead uh, this week. So. In addition to whatever Trump does at the RNC, he will also continue to make use of his primary strategy in winning re-election, which is uh, abusing the power of his office. He called a press conference on Sunday night to announce that the FDA has issued an emergency authorization for blood plasma, plasma, as he said. Why can't he say fucking plasma? Plasma. Blood plasma infusions as therapeutic treatment for coronavirus patients, even though FDA scientists voiced objections to Politico that the plasma has not been, quote, proven as an effective treatment. Axios reports that Trump administration officials have been putting pressure on the FDA. Just last week, trade advisor Peter Navarro said to officials at the FDA, quote, you are all deep state and you need to get on Trump time. <laughs> so, <laughs> Tommy, Trump and his strategists clearly think that any kind of announcements around COVID treatments and vaccines help him politically, which obviously has horrifying implications. But do you even think that's true? <laughs> I struggle with this one. I mean, is the average voter happy about Trump's handling of the coronavirus if they're still stuck at home or if their kids can't go to school or if you're one of like 30 million people out of work? My guess is probably not. I mean, we shouldn't underestimate his ability to bullshit his base into just magically thinking things are better. We saw that with the economy, but I have a harder time believing it applies here. Like, are you really going to be like 175,000 people are dead? The economy is decimated. But I just overheard some moron on Fox and Friends talking about plasma. So now we're good to go. I, I don't know. <laughs> I struggle with that one. Love it. What do you think? I mean, some people thought that there was a story in the Financial Times that it wasn't going to be the plasma thing, that it was going to be um, that in October they're going to do an emergency, youth author emergency use authorization for the Oxford vaccine, potentially, so that Trump can announce there'll be a vaccine before the election. Like, do you think this kind of thing can work? What do you think? I don't know. 
I would say that people at this point are used to Donald Trump saying things that don't turn out to be true. Uh, that is then dismissed by the vast majority of people and embraced as a kind of proof of how good he is uh, because he's so good at playing the media by his base who are so smart that they can they know when he's honest and know when he's not. But I, I will say I'm more worried about the... To me, the thing that makes me nervous is not like basically what amounts to kind of bigging up a incremental advance. What makes me nervous is more of a Donald Trump taking credit for something and then actually there is follow up of a because once there is a, a vaccine that goes into production, it becomes, you know, the biggest story in politics and in the news. And then we are following it every single day, the debates about distribution, the debates about who gets it first. Uh, will it go to nurses and healthcare professionals? Will it go to seniors? Will it go to teachers? That becomes an all consuming debate that he's very much a part of and taking credit for. So that makes me nervous sincerely, but um, I don't know that in October he'll be in a position to start that conversation. What matters to me is less Donald Trump going to a podium and making a claim and more uh, the kind of follow on news stories that make it seem true. Yeah, I will say, you know, we have the the folks at Navigator have done poll, a lot of polling on uh, people's opinions around the pandemic and Trump. And uh, on their last poll, even among people who are in high infection states, 57% say they are more concerned about going too far and pushing to develop a vaccine quickly rather than being too cautious and slow. So I think a, there's there's that when you hear Donald Trump just like touting a new treatment or vaccine. B, I also find it weird that like, so what is what is Trump's argument here come November, come October? Like, vote for me and you'll get a vaccine. Vote for Joe Biden and I'm taking the vaccine with me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is he gonna hold up the secret recipe with a lighter? Like, what, what is the what's the pitch? Like, I just, I just don't get why that's a real why that's a big reelection argument, like why that's the big October surprise. I, I think it's more about Trump saying something along the lines of if it weren't for me, this vaccine would be months off because I pushed these dumb, deep state namby pamby uh, uh, government insiders who are too slow and too cautious and too worried about how it looks. And I pushed them and I pushed them and I got this vaccine done faster. And so because of me, I stopped the virus. I stop, he'll say, I stopped the China virus by keeping people out of the US. And then I'm stopping the virus by getting the vaccine done early. Um, and that, I think, is the, the case he'll make. Yeah, so then it's like, stick with me, and we get this vaccine that I push for, and the economy's back open. You go with Sleepy Joe, and he probably gums up the works again on the vaccine and shuts yeah, the just, whole country down. He just only gives it to, to Elon Omar and Antifa. Nobody else gets it. <laughs> Becomes a Muslim-only vaccine. We're we are joking about this now in October. That line oh, will yeah. probably come out of his mouth. Yeah, um, yeah. <clears throat> He'll fall asleep during the meeting about it or something, yeah. So, so on that note, you know, Trump and other Republicans are also attacking Joe Biden for saying he'll follow the advice of public health experts if he's elected. Uh, in response to a question from ABC's David Muir about what he would do if scientists recommended another shutdown, Biden said, quote, I would shut it down. I would listen to the scientists. We're going to do whatever it takes to save lives. In response, Donald Trump tweeted, Despite biggest ever job gains and a V-shaped recovery, Joe Biden said, I would shut it down, referring to our country. He has no clue. Uh, Tommy, Trump and the Republicans are very excited about this line of attack. Is it smart? We just had this debate. We just <laughs> had this debate. Politicians who took the coronavirus seriously, who listened to scientists, saw their approval ratings go, go up. Those who didn't were hurt politically. This is not, it's not like a federal thing. It's look at the governors. Governors in Arizona, Texas, and Florida all saw their numbers tank. But Roy Cooper in North Carolina, who took all kinds of shit from Trump because he wouldn't let the RNC happen in Charlotte without social distancing and masks and other health protocols, he his approval rating was almost at 60%. Like, look, I, I can't predict the future. Maybe people are sick of lockdowns and the context has changed. But I still think the safest political ground for Biden or Trump or anybody is to show that you will follow the scientists and do what they say. Because I don't think anyone wants like a, a chop shop uh, vaccine from Putin in Russia or, you know, to keep the economy open when people are getting really sick. It's like this seems so obvious to me. Love it. I mean, I've been very pleasantly surprised at how patient most of the public has been about this because, you know, we've now gone through this, as Tommy pointed out, many times <laughs> where Trump says Democrats want to shut the country down and I don't. 
Um, and every time it turns out, you know, there's some people who think, oh, that's going to be a political winner for him. And, and then it turns out people are much more patient because they are scared about opening up the country without a vaccine or without having gotten the virus under control. Um, but what do you think about that? Does that does that surprise you? Or do you think that like people could finally be sick of it now? And this is a this was one where it's beyond Trump. There was a bunch of Republican strategists. Some of the more right leaning reporters were tweeting this like we'll probably hear this all week at the convention, I'm sure. Yeah, no, I, um. So I think Biden is on the best ground when he says you can't actually choose between the economy and your health. The only way the economy comes back is if we take care of people's health. That to me is is incredibly uh, um, like sort of clear, like popular, obvious. Um, I also do agree, understand why he's saying what he's saying. And I think it's admirable that he's letting the science lead and really kind of delivering a maximal position right you know i will do what the scientists say if they say shut it down i will shut it down i get that i also i also agree that the polls have been incredibly heartening about how patient people and generous people are about this even now to this day right even as parents are now experiencing the hardship of what happens when schools either have to open and shut or can't open or are partially open and it's an entire mess there's the polls have shifted to parents wanting to make sure schools don't open right they understand the stakes of the virus that said uh, you know, Donald Trump has made his career on telling people, basically getting people to forget what their minds know is true, to go with something easy, to go with something that feels good. And even as people know instinctively that opening up might be wrong, that Biden's positions are correct, there's something appealing <laughs> about a guy going up there and saying, elect me, it's Mardi Gras, right? It's just, <laughs> you know, give in. It'll all be okay. It's fine. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Don't listen to these naysayers. So like, I, I think he's saying the right things, but I do think there's a head heart issue. It's a little fool me once though. You know, like you can say that the first time and then we, uh, you know, the, the restaurants all open up and the schools open up and suddenly cases are shooting through the roof. Right. Like, I just think, I think that the other part of this is that Biden, the, the question to Biden was if the scientists say this, right? And so what Bi I think Biden is on the best, the firmest ground, as you said, making sure he continues to repeat, I will follow the guidance of scientists. So like, hopefully Joe Biden wins and there's a vaccine or there's a vaccine in development and it's very close. But like, if it's a choice between, do you wanna fucking stumble through 2021 like we stumbled through 2020, where we just have these like outbreaks and flare ups because everyone opens, then we have to shut down again, or do you want to do four weeks of a real solid shutdown and then actually tamp the virus down so then we can open up for the rest of the year? Obviously, you'd choose the latter, but um, you get just have to make that clear and say that you're going to follow scientists. And John, obviously, Donald Trump hasn't. John, it's really unfair of you to say this. The 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 fifty bullet policy plan they rolled out clearly says return to normal in 2021 in the COVID section. Please don't, you know, lie about his record or his plans. <laughs> can you imagine can you imagine Donald Trump a Donald Trump re-election slogan is return to normal 2021? <laughs> what about yeah. just vote for Donald Trump to return to normal? That's yeah. uh... I want to make one more point too, which is they're going around saying that they are responsible for the biggest job gains in history. And it is one of the most uh idiotic claims. If you if what's actually happening is you have the the, the most precipitous do job drop in history and a tiny little recovery, like like just a dead cat bounce, this like tiny bit of, of increase. And the idea that they're going to campaign on the fact that it went from having lost, what, 50 million jobs to 45 million jobs is uh, is astounding. I can't believe they think they can get away with that. Yeah, it's it's wild. Um, all right, let's talk about the latest developments in the uh, the great post office crisis of 2020. Uh, Postmaster General Louis DeJoy is testifying before the House today. He was in front of the Senate on Friday where he said, quote, there has been no changes to any policies with regard to election mail. The Postal Service is fully capable and committed to delivering the nation's election mail fully on time. He said he's pausing any additional changes in advance of the election, but he refused to reverse changes he's already made, like removing mailboxes and sorting machines. House Democrats also passed a bill with the help of 26 Republicans that would provide $25 billion to the post office and according to roll call, prevent it from taking any action that would reduce services or impede timely delivery during the pandemic. And it would also require to treat all election mail as first class mail, postmark it with the data receipt and to the maximum extent practical, process it as soon as it's received. So love it. McConnell and Trump have refused to support this bill. Trump was tweeting, you know, voter fraud conspiracies again this morning. He was talking about it at the convention already. How useful do you think um, this vote by Democrats and these hearings were? 
I think pretty useful. Um, uh, you know, it is difficult to know how responsive someone like DeJoy is to shame and ordinary politics. But I will say that that some of the moments that that have broken out from the hearings today, we're recording this Monday, and, and there may have, there may be more, and we may have missed some stuff. It's happening in real time, but. I thought the two most interesting things that came out of the hearing were, uh, one, um, DeJoy basically flat out denied that there were overtime, that he was responsible for the overtime cuts uh, and and some of the, the, the some of the other changes uh, uh, in policy that caused the delay, even though there is just like documentary evidence, just sort of physical evidence that he actually did, which tells you he's really nervous about this and trying to evade responsibility for some of these changes. And the other thing was Ro Khanna pushed DeJoy on the elimination of some of these sorting machines and whether they could come back on, and it got a little bit tense. And and DeJoy said, give me a billion dollars and I'll set them back up, basically. Um, so it tells you that... Uh, um, that this has gotten to DeJoy, and it tells you that getting them the money uh, removes a key argument that DeJoy and uh, his allies are making about why these service changes were necessary. Tommy, do you have any uh, big takeaways from the hearing, and do you think we should be relieved that DeJoy has agreed not to make any more changes? Uh, I'm not relieved. I mean, look, you know, being out of power sucks. Good for Pelosi and the House Democrats for holding this hearing. Good for them for passing a bill. I think people are much more aware of what was happening with the Postal Service than they were before. I think that 26 Republicans voting with Democrats is a big deal. It's a big crossover, and hopefully it creates even more pressure on Republicans in the Senate who are up for re-election. I think bigger picture, Democrats can argue and should argue, we're here doing our jobs. Like We passed a major bill to bail out the post office. Uh, so that veterans can get their medications. We passed a major COVID relief bill. Where the hell are you? Like, where is Mitch McConnell? Because, you know, a few weeks later, uh, we now know that Trump's bullshit stimulus EO is not working. Like one or two states are actually paying the $300 stimulus. The rest are like caught up in bureaucracy. You're not going to do it or who knows. But, you know, consumer spending is now collapsing. That will lead to more job losses. States are broke. They're going to lay off people. Like we're in historic crisis. Everything is getting worse. It does allow Pelosi and the Democrats to put pressure on Republicans to come together and do something. I'm not saying it's going to work because the Republican Party is broken, but like they're, they're doing the right things to position themselves to have that chance. Yeah, I, I think that the the hearings are probably more useful than I even thought they would be because it it does seem like they're doing everything they can to hold the joy accountable. They're saying come back with a plan and exactly how you're going to make sure that you can process all this election mail. They got to joy to say that he was going to like send out a letter to every American in September to talk about like election deadlines and when they should be getting their ballots in and all this kind of stuff. So if they can keep up the pressure on DeJoy and haul his ass back in there in in a couple weeks if things haven't changed or things are still bad, then like I do think that can have some effect. But I, I do think the, the, the biggest effect of the entire, all these hearings and, you know, bringing Congress back from recess to do the vote, if, if nothing else, if it just lets people know to vote early, to request your ballot early, to get it back in as early as possible, that there is potentially some problems with the postal service that they're delivering mail too late that there are delays that there is reductions in service if if everyone if more people in the country are aware of this and can act accordingly to get their ballots in as early as possible then that i think will be a win because like we're going to be able to you know we've had mark elias on there's plenty of lawsuits out there it doesn't seem like legislation is going to happen it doesn't seem like trump is going <laughs> to do anything about this so the only option we have is to request your ballot early and drop it off early. Like that is the most important thing we can do right now. Also tomorrow is Tuesday, which means there's a brand new episode of Missing America out. Ben talks to an anonymous activist about the daily marches and protests taking place in Hong Kong, and they sound the alarm on the dangers of a growing authoritarian power. So check it out wherever you get your podcasts. Also, if you wanna hate watch the RNC with us, we will be on our group thread each night this week, starting at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Watch with us at cricket.com slash convention and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash crooked media. A lot of content this week, boys. A lot of content. A lot of content.